We usually reject the null hypothesis if the test statistic is statistically significant at the significance level that we chose. Now, unfortunately, there's no precise way to choose the significance level. And there exists the possibility that we might make an error when we conduct the hypothesis test. So hopefully, most of the time, we'll reach the correct conclusion. That is, if the null hypothesis is wrong, we'll reject it. And if the null hypothesis is true, then we won't reject it. But there are obviously two types of error that we could make. The first error is that we reject the null hypothesis when really it was true. This is usually called a type 1 error. The second error that we could make is rejecting the null, sorry, is not rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact it was false. This is called a type 2 error. Now a type 1 error is usually denoted by the Greek letter alpha. Once again, unfortunately, this is nothing whatsoever to do with the regression intercept term. It's simply something denoted by the same letter. The probability of type 2 error, on the other hand, is usually denoted by the Greek letter beta. So we can represent the four possible outcomes of our hypothesis test in terms of whether they're correct or not correct on a chart. So on the diagonal terms, we've made an error. On the two off diagonals, uh, we've reached the right conclusion. Now, we can be quite precise about what the probability of a type 1 error is. Now, the probability of a type 1 error is the probability that uh, we uh, reject a null hypothesis that was in fact correct. Now, if you remember what I said during the last session, uh, sometimes, purely by chance alone, uh, a test statistic will take on an extreme value. So going back to the kind of diagram that we drew last week, uh, let's suppose that we've got some uh, t distribution uh, and we've got a test statistic that follows this t distribution. Now purely by chance alone, the uh, test statistic will take on an extreme value uh, some of the time. More specifically, if we assume a 5% significance level overall so that we place 2.5% uh, of the distribution in these uh, rejection regions. Obviously that means that we have a 95% non-rejection region in the middle of the distribution. What this is saying is purely by chance alone we'll end up with a test statistic value in this part of the distribution 2.5% of the time and in this part of the distribution 2.5% of the time. That is, even if the null hypothesis was correct, purely by chance alone, we'll end up rejecting the null hypothesis 5% of the time overall. So, the probability of type 1 error, or alpha, is exactly equal to the significance level that we use. If we use a 1% significance level, the probability of type 1 error is 1%, and 1% of the time, purely by chance alone, will end up rejecting a null hypothesis that was correct. If we use a 10% significance level, on the other hand, uh, then the probability of type 1 error will be 10%, and 10% of the time, purely by chance alone, we'd end up rejecting the null hypothesis. So clearly you can see that the probability of type 1 error exactly equals the significance level that we use in the test. Unfortunately, it's not possible to have a simple rule linking the significance level that we use with the probability of a type 2 error or beta. Now the probability of type 2 error, which is uh, usually termed beta, will depend upon uh, how wrong the value that we are hypothesizing is. So for example, suppose that uh, the true beta uh, for the population was, let's say, uh, took on a value of 1. But let's suppose that the value that we were testing for beta under the null hypothesis was 100. Clearly, in this case, the null hypothesis that we're testing is very wrong compared to the true value. We therefore expect that we would reject that null hypothesis a very high proportion of the time. So the probability for type 2 error will be relatively small. If, on the other hand, we were testing a null hypothesis that the true value of beta was uh, 1.2, for example, let's say, then here the null hypothesis value isn't very wrong compared with the true value. 
So in that situation, we're much uh, more likely to commit a type 2 error. That is, we're much more likely to not reject the null hypothesis when that null hypothesis, in fact, was wrong and it should have been rejected. So even in this case, you can see that the null hypothesis is wrong, so we should reject it, but it's going to be much harder in this case to distinguish between the true value and the value that we're hypothesizing uh, under the null. Now, it might seem to be the case that we could very easily reduce the probability of a type 1 error by reducing the significance level. To see how that works, let's suppose that we started off with uh, a 5% significance level overall, as we have in this diagram here as it stands. Now, we could very easily reduce the probability of type 1 error by reducing the significance level. So, for example, suppose that we reduce the significance level or size of test to 1%. Then, uh, on this diagram, we could represent the appropriate rejection regions uh, by uh, the green shaded area. Uh, in that case, we'd have uh, just half a percent of the distribution in each of the extremes. Clearly now, uh, the test statistic would have to be much bigger and positive, or much bigger and negative, in other words, much more extreme, before we would reject the null hypothesis. So that clearly would have the impact of reducing the probability of type 1 error. We need much more evidence against the null hypothesis before we would reject it. Now, unfortunately, there's no possibility here for what we might call a free lunch. In other words, while we would indeed succeed in reducing the probability of a type 1 error if we reduce the significance level, this also has uh, the implication that we increase the probability of making a type 2 error. So just as we need more evidence against the null hypothesis before we would correctly reject it, uh, we'd also need more evidence against it uh, before we reject it full stop. So that means that if we use a more strict criterion for rejection, that is, we use a smaller significance level, we will more frequently not reject the null hypothesis when we should have done, thus increasing the probability of a type 2 error. So we can't play around with the significance level and reduce the probability of both types of error. And this is why there is some debate in the literature about whether it's more appropriate to use a 1%, 5%, or 10% significance level, and that's why there's no definitive method of choosing between them. If we reduce the probability of one type of error, we increase the probability of the other type of error. The only way that we can, in fact, reduce the probability of both type 1 and type 2 errors together is if we increase the sample size that we use in our analysis. If we increase the sample size, that means we've got more information upon which to reliably estimate the coefficients and their standard errors. More information and more reliable estimation means that uh, our test statistics will be estimated more precisely and we're more likely to reach the appropriate conclusion. OK. Now, uh, we can see that if we want to uh, reliably uh, perform inferences from the sample estimates that we've got to the population, then we need to use a range of significance levels and hopefully we'll find the result that uh, the conclusion we reach will be the same whatever significance level we use. So what we want is to always reject the null hypothesis, whether we use a 10%, 5% or 1% significance level, or we want to always not reject it. Uh, what we would like, however, is one single measure that removed from us the requirement that we had to look in the t-tables a number of times for different critical values corresponding to different significance levels. Unfortunately, there is such a statistic in existence, and that statistic is known as the p-value. And p here stands for probability. So the probability value gives us the exact or marginal significance level where we would just be indifferent between rejecting and not rejecting the null hypothesis. Uh, so it's as if, uh, by knowing the p-value, it embodies the test statistic and an infinite number of critical values. So in fact, we can throw our t-statistics, uh, sorry, our uh, t-distribution tables away. We don't need to look at those anymore if we have the p-value. The p-value will tell us everything we need to know about whether we're going to reject or not reject the null hypothesis at each level of significance. So to give you an example, let's suppose that we uh, do a t-test 
and the test statistic follows a T distribution with 62 degrees of freedom. And let's suppose that the calculated value of that test statistic is 1.47. And let's also suppose that the p value uh, equals 0 0.12. Now, it doesn't matter at this stage where the p value comes from. In practice, we'll never need to, to calculate those. The computer will always do that job for us. So we'll tell the computer what test we, we want to perform and what distribution the test statistic follows. And it will calculate automatically for us the p-value. And the way that it does that is to uh, construct the p-value from the uh, inverse of the t-distribution. So anyway, let's suppose that we've got a test statistic value of 1.47 uh, corresponding to a p-value of 0 0.12. Now let's suppose that this is a one-sided test just to make life a little simpler. Uh, now, if the p-value is 0 0.12, that tells us something very precise about whether we reject or don't reject the null hypothesis at each level of significance. So let's once again draw our familiar diagram for the t-distribution. And uh, once again, let's suppose that we're just doing a one-sided test and we're interested only in the upper tail. Now, we've got some test statistic value, which is 1.47. And we're asking ourselves the question, would we reject or not reject this null hypothesis at various different significance levels? Well, let's suppose, first of all, that we ran a 5% test. Uh, would we reject this null hypothesis? Well, in fact, if we uh, looked in the uh, T tables for the critical value, we'd find that uh, the relevant critical value for a 5% test was much bigger than 1.47. So, in fact, if we used a 5% significance level, uh, the test statistic falls in the non-rejection region and we would not reject the null hypothesis. Now, let's suppose that we increase the significance level up to 10%. So, now we've got 10% of the distribution uh, in the uh, rejection region. And once again, just to reiterate, we're doing a one-sided test here, and so we're only interested in looking at one tail of the distribution. Well, it turns out, once again, if we looked at the critical value for a 10% one-sided significance level, then, uh, once again, that critical value would be bigger than the test statistic, so we would not reject the null hypothesis. Now, what would happen, let's say, if we did a 20% significance level test? Well, we could do that, of course, even though 20% is larger than the significance level that we commonly use. Well, it turns out that if we used a 20% size of test, then uh, the test statistic would now lie in the uh, rejection region. So you can see if we use a 10% significance level, we don't reject. If we use a 20% significance level, we do reject. What about if we used an 11% significance level? Well, if we used an 11% significance level, we would not reject. In fact, the uh, critical value would be just to the right of the test statistic here. If we used a 13% significance level, on the other hand, then the test statistic would fall here just within the rejection region. What happens, on the other hand, if we use a 12% significance level? Well, if we used a 12% significance level, then it turns out that the critical value would exactly equal 1.47. In other words, we'd be exactly indifferent between rejecting and not rejecting the null hypothesis. So you can see that this p-value of 0 0.12 tells us that 12% is the significance level where we'd be exactly indifferent between rejecting and not rejecting the null hypothesis. So what does that tell us about whether we should reject or not reject the null hypothesis for this particular value of the test statistic? Well, in this particular case, we can see that this p-value is bigger than 0 0.05. So if we're using the conventional 5% significance level, then we would clearly not reject this null hypothesis. In fact, we'd only reject it if we use a significance level greater than 12%. To give you a couple of other simple examples, let's suppose that we got a p-value of 0.02 and a p-value of 0.5. As I suggested earlier, the p in p-value uh, stands for probability. Therefore, we know that because it's a probability, it must lie between 0 and 1. Now, a p-value of very close to 0 suggests that um, the test statistic is very large in absolute value. 
So uh, the smaller the p-value, the closer it is to zero, the larger is the test statistic in absolute value. So a p-value of 0.02 is clearly smaller than 0.05. So if we were using the conventional 5% significance level, we would reject the null hypothesis. On the other hand, a p-value of 0.5 is clearly much bigger than the conventional significance levels of 1 or 5 or 10%. That being the case, the p-value being big here suggests that the test statistic is relatively small in absolute value. In other words, it falls very close to the centre of the distribution in the non-rejection region. So in this case, we clearly not reject the null hypothesis. Whilst the p and p-value actually stands for probability, you can also think of the p standing for plausibility. So the p-value tells us the plausibility of the null hypothesis. If we've got a p-value of 0.02, that suggests that the null hypothesis is very implausible. In other words, the test statistic is big in absolute value and we've got lots of evidence against that null hypothesis. If the p-value, on the other hand, is 0.5 or something like that, that suggests that the p-value, sorry, that the... Uh, that the null hypothesis is quite plausible and we don't have very much evidence against it which would lead us uh, to reject it. So you can see that p-values are very, very useful because they tell us everything we need to know about the test statistic and the distribution. And they also tell us much more than a simple reject or not reject rule at a given significance level. For example, suppose that we compared between a p-value of 0.02 and a p-value that was much smaller than that. So let's suppose that we had a p-value of 0.000002 uh, and one of 0.02. The p-value of 0.02 shows that we're only just rejecting the null hypothesis at the 5% level. If we used a 1% significance level here, we wouldn't reject the null hypothesis. In this first case, on the other hand, we can see that the plausibility of the null hypothesis is much smaller, very, very much smaller. In fact, it's very, very implausible. So this p-value up here says it's extremely unlikely indeed that we could have generated a test statistic as extreme as this by chance alone. So given that, you can see if we just use a simple rejection or non-rejection rule that said we reject uh, if the test statistic is significant at the 5% level, we wouldn't be able to distinguish between these two cases. But in practice, these are very, very different cases. This is just a marginal rejection. This is a very, very strong rejection indeed.